Thanks for joining today. I'm going to talk today about some work that we've done looking at radiation exposure across um, several large integrated healthcare systems. As a little bit of background on how we got to this topic, um, there's been a fair bit of work over the last several years about patterns of diagnostic imaging across um, fee-for-service models of care. And imaging has gone up dramatically in those settings. Um, there's been less known about patterns of in imaging within, um, in the context of integrated healthcare systems. And these systems are potentially very different than a fee-for-service model. There are very different financial incentives. Potentially there are incentives to decrease imaging rather than incentives to have more imaging in the fee-for-service model. Um, there's also the potential to have quality improvement programs that are more um, overarching within the entire system that could result in very different patterns of care in the conduct of exams. And so we we were interested in looking at medical imaging, doses, and what was done in actual clinical practice within the context of these integrated healthcare systems. One of the other things that these integrated healthcare systems offer is it's a possibility to follow patients over time, and it's easier to do that in, than in the fee-for-service model. So we could look at cumulative exposure to radiation within each year of our study. Um, the paper that I'm going to describe was published um, last year in, um, in JAMA, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and the title was Using Use of Diagnostic Imaging Studies and Associated Radiation Exposure for Patients Enrolled in Large Integrated Healthcare Systems, and we looked at data that went through 2010. Um, the study design was basically a retrospective analysis. We looked at existing healthcare um, records, and we included data from six large integrated healthcare systems from different regions of the United States. We looked at details of the medical records that permitted us to assess actual radiation exposure for selected tests, and overall the number of enrolled patients varied year to year, but it was between one and two million patients each year that were included from 96 to 2010. I want to point out that these were not patients as so much as enrollees. These were members of the health plans, and they include some patients patients who were very sick and had lots of health care, and some patients who never um, saw a physician during the entire time of the study. So in terms of the results, what did we learn? First, the enrollees underwent quite a large number of imaging tests. We had a large number of enrollees, and overall they underwent over 30 million imaging tests. And this overall averaged to about one test, 1.2 tests per person per year. Two-thirds of those tests were plain x-rays, and a third of those tests were for advanced diagnostic imaging. That means CT, MRI, nuclear medicine, or ultrasound. And CT and MRI and PET scanning in the more recent years of the study grew substantially. CT and MRI grew um, between 8 and 10 percent per year. PET scanning grew about 25 percent per year in the last number of years. Um, what was very interesting about the results is that the different um, sites adopted different tests for different indications, and there was really dramatic variation. So it's not like chest CT grew the same amount across all of our integrated healthcare systems. Some had a dramatic rise in chest CT, where others had a dramatic rise in certain kinds of MR, but very little rise in that kind of CT. So we were struck by how varying the adoption of different tests were. Everything went up, but to very different degrees. Um, I could show you lots of patterns of imaging over time. This image shows CT scanning. Each of the individual lines represents the data for a different healthcare system. And so by 2010, overall, we were just under 200 CT scans per thousand enrollees per year, sort of not quite one in five. But there was pretty big differences across the different health plans, although the rise in imaging was pretty similar. You can see very similar patterns of MR in the recent years PET scanning as well. In terms of the radiation dose, which really I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time focusing on, um, in order to understand what the actual radiation dose was for CT, we extracted dose data from just over 4,500 CT examinations. And these examinations were chosen randomly. So we pulled patients based on age, where they were seen, what kind of scan it was. And so we didn't pull high ex dose exams or low dose exams. We pulled random exams where the way we were pulling them, we didn't know what the results would show. I should say that it's much easier now that there is all these dose software products available to look at the data much easily, more easily now than at the time that we did the study. And what we looked at is we pulled the dose data from the DICOM headers 
um, these are dose information that are stored within the CT scans, or we manually review the dose report. Um, and then we use metrics that both look at the dose output from the machine, the DLP, the CTDI, and then used a relatively sophisticated technique using mathematical phantoms to calculate effective dose based on summing the organ doses using ICRP weights. One of the collaborators on this project, Trensik Lee, is a mathematician who um, helped us with this part of the analysis. He's based at the National Cancer Institute. Um, the doses using every measure that we used, and we used quite a number, were high and highly variable across patients. For some examination types of CT, the doses varied 50-fold or more between different patients. We've published previous work where we've looked at radiation dose among patients um, in hospitals in the San Francisco Bay Area and found variation. And I'll say for this study, we used a much larger number of patients across a much larger number of facilities, and the doses we found were even more variable. Some of the primary results is I mentioned that CT um, increased dramatically, you saw in the figure, and this resulted in a doubling of the average mean per capita effective dose. So the average dose doubled from 1.2 to 2.3 of the study period. And for people who look at large populations, it's very difficult to actually double the entire population's anything. We usually look at very small changes and get very um, interested in them. This is a doubling, is a very large change. Um, this also resulted in a doubling in the proportion of enrollees who received very high doses, greater than 20 to 50 millisievert exposure in a single year. This increased from 1.2% to 2.5%. And then it also in, you know, led to a doubling um, of the proportion of patients who received very high doses, uh, defined as greater than 50 millisieverts per year. That increased from 0.6 to 1.4. It's a little difficult for medical imaging to know what's a high dose, but we have to think about it in terms of some standards that we can understand. In um, most of the industrialized world, um, occupational workers are not allowed to receive doses greater than 20 millisieverts per year. In the United States, the comparable number is 50 millisieverts per year. And people in occupations who get exposed to radiation are no longer allowed to do that when they're exposed to doses that are this high. And yet a substantial minority of patients in these integrated healthcare systems were exposed to these doses, just highlighting the need to make sure that the doses were needed for these individual patients. By the last year of our study, 6.8% of enrollees who underwent imaging received a high annual exposure greater than 20 to 50 millisieverts, and just under 4% received a very high exposure. So these were a large number of individuals receiving relatively high exposures. Um, you can look more carefully in the paper to look at the proportion of enrollees who receive these high doses, but one of the things that's very clear is that the proportion of individuals who receive these high doses increases dramatically with age. So among patients who are greater than age 65, um, over 20% receive moderate doses and 7% very high doses annually. And I say annually because this was only looking at a single year of exposure, and there is a very high association between receiving a high dose one year and receiving a high dose the next year. Um, this figure shows the proportion of patients who were at the highest exposure level. So these were the patients who received the top 10% of dose or the top 1% of dose. And you can just see that among the highest enrolled individuals, these patients are getting very high doses, on average over 100 millisieverts per year. And these are not a handful of rare individuals. These are 1% of enrollees of the HMO. So these are lots of individuals getting very high doses. Um, we've heard at this conference from Dr. Lenny Berlin about the mock trial that he organized at the RSNA this year. And that was a fictitious case about a young woman who received an exposure, I think it was about 300, 250 to 300 millisieverts over um, a decade of her life. And one of the arguments that some of the participants in the trial made was that no one gets that kind of dose. Maybe there is one or two people or a handful of people. And what I'm showing you here is that in a single year, a large number of patients are receiving these kind of excessive doses. I mentioned the doses were highly variable 
why? Well, why did we see just variability? We, had, we were hoping that there would be more consistency among these integrated healthcare systems. And we explored many patient factors that might have explained the variation in doses used. Um, we had weight and BMI for the vast majority of our patients, and clearly these were both important predictors of dose. So very um, heavy patients had higher doses and very slight patients had low doses, but I will say that the variation in weight explained a very small proportion of dose. So yes, it was important, but it didn't explain much of the variation. Thus, the differences in the dose between patients were not due to the size requiring different doses. Um, the high doses that were used um, were not because of weight to the 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 largest degree. And what's important is these high doses contributed enormously to the population's exposure. So um, Dr. Migliaretti um, is speaking at this meeting about um, what, um, what would happen among children if the doses were lowered. Um, her paper is coming out next month. But basically, if we could reduce the highest quarter of doses, the really high doses, we could reduce the total exposure, the total burden of radiation by nearly 50%. So there's a lot of improvement that can happen by just working on these highest doses, which weren't used for good reason in most cases. I'm showing you a few graphs that are showing some of the data that I just said that we use. This is showing DLP, one of the metrics we looked at, by weight. So on the x-axis is showing weight, and the y-axis DLP. And what you can see is there's all over the map DLP. And it's not because it was used in high DLP and high weight patients. Rather, it was randomly used. Um, this would sort of be a good threshold of sort of, not exactly a do not exceed, but sort of where dose should be for this particular type of exam. And the vast majority of patients had doses much higher than this value. And we saw this with every metric we looked at. This is a metric of CTDI versus weight, and the doses are really all over the map. And it wasn't that the higher CTDI value were really particularly used in large patients. Um, this last figure on the topic is showing sort of the distribution in dose by the weight of the patient. These are called box plots. The top and the bottom within each weight group are showing sort of where most patients fell. And the horizontal line, which within each of these box plots, shows the middle line. And you can see the middle line goes up, meaning for abdominal pelvis scan, um, these are patients um, we limited here to greater than 35 pounds, and we've broken it up by weight. So the left group are 35 to 55 pounds, 55 to 75. The highest weight is greater than 200 pounds. Um, it's showing that, yes, the weight um, is associated with slightly higher dose, but mostly there's incredible variation in the dose, even within these relatively narrow um, weight categories. And thus, I am emphasizing this because often we decide that, we have decided that the amount of variation in radiation is not a problem, that it's really suited to the variation in our patients. And that's really not the case. I, I agree that weight is important. This should lead to changes in how you optimize doses. And many of the lectures in sessions one, two, and three were focused on trying to help you optimize the studies for your patients. But when you're even doing this kind of optimizing, this will change the radiation dose by a factor of one to three fold different. Whereas the variation that we saw in this study can lead to differences that are 50 or 100 fold, and that's not due to weight. And if you have enormous variation in your patients, you need to explore why you have that variation, not assume that it was done correctly based on weight. In actual practice, we found facilities are not altering the doses they use based on patient weight. We could do a better job here, and thus we should pay more attention to weight and reduce the variation from other sources. In terms of overall where patients' radiation exposure is coming from, I think it's generally known that CT is very important to the total dose. Um, the amount that CT has gone up has really led to the dramatic increase in the number of enrollees exposed to high doses of radiation. In our first years that we studied, 1996, CT accounted overall for around 6% of tests and 30% of enrollees' exposure to ionizing radiation. And per capita within this population, it contributed to 0.4 millisieverts per enrollee. 
By the last year, CT accounted for about twice that many studies, 6% of total number of studies, but almost 70% of the radiation exposure, and contributed not 0.4 millisieverts per enrollee, but 1.6 millisieverts per enrollee. So a fourfold increase in the per capita radiation exposure from CT. In geography and fluoroscopy, accounted for a far declining proportion of exams and an even more steeply declining proportion of absolute radiation dose. I want to just spend a minute to talk about imaging and age. Imaging in, with CT as well as nuclear medicine, nuclear medicine contributes about a quarter of the radiation exposure in this population, increased steeply with age, and both of the uh, ex exams did. And this resulted in a particularly high exposure received by the oldest enrollees. Although cancer risks from radiation are also con often considered to decline with age, they do decline with age. So they're the highest risks among the youngest patients, and then they decline. Recent models suggest that cancer risks then begin to rise in middle age. Um, so cancer risks go down, but then they come back up. And they come back up in the age group where we're doing even more imaging. And so it's a U-shaped distribution. And so where imaging is going up, the cancer risk may also be going up. And so those are ages we need to think a little bit more about than we have in the past. This figure from the JAMA paper shows within different age groups imaging over time. So within each group, why don't we look at the 75 to 85 year olds, each of those little tiny vertical lines shows imaging over time. And among 75 to 85 year olds, you can see imaging rows um, dramatically over time. But in general, the doses among the 75 to 85 year olds or 65 to 74 year olds are much, much higher than in younger, um, in younger individuals. So we're really using a lot of imaging. The rise is more rapid and the rates are much higher. In the highest individuals, almost one in two get a CT scan per year. And thus, really, this is a group that we need to think about whether or not all of those exams are necessary and begin to think more about how we lower the doses in those age groups. We've done a very good job of raising awareness of the need to lower doses in children and young adults. I think it's important to increase our efforts to re reduce the doses in everyone, not just young people. Um, I mentioned when I started out that one of the things we were looking at is how patterns may differ in patients enrolled in integrated healthcare systems. And there were a few differences. Overall utilization was modestly lower. Depending on what test and what year, it was about 15 to 30 percent lower than patients enrolled in fee-for-surface models. It was a little difficult to know if that um, association that we found was true. It could be underlying differences in the population. In general, fee-for-service older patients, for example, might be sicker than those in rage, uh, uh, enrolled in HMOs. Um, we looked at only a limited number of geographical areas. Um, and so it's hard to know if the, the, this difference was real, but the, the exposure seemed to be slightly lower in this HMO or integrated healthcare system setting. So in summary, um, the rates of imaging in integrated settings are high, very high, in the same ballpark as we've seen in other settings. Um, the radiation doses that we found as recently as 2010 showed high doses, highly variable doses, and we did not see the kind of decline in doses over time that we've heard about. Um, maybe doses could have come down, but they didn't in the period that we looked at. And I think it's very important for um, quality improvement projects to try to target the highest dose examinations in order to really bring those doses down, because I think the impact on the population could be very helpful. Thank you so much for your attention.